Tony Levin is the legendary bassist for King Crimson, Peter Gabriel, and a million other bands. He's also a wonderful t photographer, and uh, he, a couple years ago, released a King Crimson print collection. And we got to talk to him about that, and we got a whole bunch of footage of it, and you should check out that video if you missed it. And now he has a new collection of prints out uh, containing uh, pictures from his time with Peter Gabriel over the last few decades. They're really wonderful. There's five prints in this collection. I have a couple of them framed here behind me. And I got to talk to Tony right after he got back from tour with Peter Gabriel in Europe. And um, so this video is that conversation. But before we get to that, just check out TonyLevinPrints.com, P-R-I-N-T-S.com, uh, so that you can learn more about the process and how to buy them and all that stuff. Really, if you're a Peter Gabriel fan, these are just great photos to have and hang on your wall and, you know, just to enjoy. And credit to John Lybrook, he's the sort of brains and the hands that got dirty doing all of the printing, packaging, and all that stuff. He runs the website. So, uh, and if you are an artist and you want prints, you know, talk to John Lybrook. So, learn more at TonyLevinPrints.com, P-R-I-N-T-S, TonyLevinPrints.com. Enjoy the conversation. How was the tour? Excellent. Yeah, really great. Great. Peter's awesome. The music was fantastic. Those two, three hours a day were fantastic. So Peter's in great voice. He's written amazing new material that, that I still love after playing 24 shows of it. And uh, it's a thrill to be on stage with him. He's performing as, as well as, as ever. We, When we go a long period without touring, Peter and I and others of our age, uh, we wonder what will be there in the tank when we come back. And, and it was uh, exhilarating to be on stage with him and, and great pleasure. Of course, I'm taking pictures on tour. Peter's very good natured about that, including taking pictures from the stage. But I was realizing on this tour, it takes me a lot of shows. to I take pictures for the website and, and they're appropriate for that. But to really get classic good shots, I realize it takes me a long time to see the points, the few points in the show and, and where I have the right angle and the right situation and lighting, and then to adjust and have the right lens and stuff. So even though we did 24 concerts, I don't, I don't yet have photos that I'm satisfied with. And I hope when we go back in September, October, uh, that I'll, I'll aim at the right places and I'll get those shots. And if I don't, it's okay. I forgive myself. But, but it's funny. I'm only just learning now that it's a process when I'm on the same tour. And of course, let me add, I'm not allowed to it's not appropriate to pick up the camera just in the middle of a song. So I have to choose the moments when I can play with one hand or when I have a few bars of not playing to pick up the camera. Yeah, I was curious. Uh, I watched some show clips on YouTube and it looked like you guys were having fun. It looked like you were actually changing it up a bit night after night. Um, I think it was the show in Berlin where Peter opened up in German <laughs> and <laughs> that was really neat to see. Um, but, you know, looking at some of these photos that you've taken over the years, uh, I mean, I just have them right next to me. I've got this one where you guys are jumping on the stage. And yeah. it's like, how did these guys go from where they were then to these giant arenas touring all over the world? And then how is that affecting your photography, you know, the work that you do? Well, uh, it's great being in arenas. It's great. Frankly, it's it's great maybe greater being in small places, even clubs. That's where you get a sense of all of the people who are there instead of just the front 30 rows or something. But it's all great, and, and, and I'm thrilled that Peter's able to play these arenas. For me, taking photography, it's the same. When I see these pictures, which I, I had handpicked as the, as the best of the classic pictures I've taken of Peter on stage, uh, I realized that I was doing much the same thing, but with the film, for those of us who remember film, and uh, uh, getting them developed was tricky and and manual focus. And I think I would set the exposure before the show because I just didn't have time. Uh, that picture you held up is is probably my tour de force uh, of of stage photography because uh, I had to, mounted the camera for the whole show. I had mounted the camera at that stage of that tour on uh, on a tripod, and I had uh, there were no electronic triggers i had a, a little tube with a squeeze bulb to take the picture that's those are still around and that's with it with a little a little button that comes out and, and physically takes the picture so i would take pictures at various times during the show with my foot i had it next to the foot pedals but on this piece uh, uh shock the monkey every time we sing shock 
uh, the three of us, P David, Rose, Peter, and myself, we, Peter would jump and David and I would jump with him. And I resolved I'm going to get a photo of that somehow. So I would focus and aim the camera before the show. Uh, I would pick up the squeeze bulb. By the way, we not only jump, but we're playing a note and singing shock. And and but and if you're there's a little maybe a half a second delay. So I'd have to time that. And then I try to arrange so that I was not blocking the camera view of Peter. And some nights my shirt or Peter's shirt came up and it was inappropriate. So of all of those, let's see, every time we sang shock in the show, every show, I would take that picture. And when one came out really it, you know, in focus, exposed right, and every everybody looked good, uh, I thought that wasn't easy and, and I'll, I'll treasure this photo. And frankly, all, that was a lot of years ago, and with this uh, with this edition, with this collection of, of photos of, of Peter, I'm able to, in a big way, share these with the public, because I, I don't know what I did with that picture. It appeared in a few books of mine, but really I felt like it's kind of my own picture, and, and it's a thrill to share it, because it was a special moment that, for once, I captured uh, correctly, I think, on film. By the way, you can, if you look closely, you can see, not the bulb in my hand, but you can see, I left the... Uh, the view of the, the the wire coming from the bulb. Actually, I love that about this photo. I spent maybe 10 minutes last night really looking over each photo in detail. It was really cool. I didn't notice it until a couple minutes in that you're taking the picture, you're squeezing the squeeze bulb, you're jumping <laughs> in the air. <laughs> and the, I was, just as someone who does a lot of video work, I was marveling at the lights in the background that they did not um, overexpose your image or anything like that. Like you really nailed it on this image. And another minor, very small detail that was totally unintentional. There's like a, a case under your right knee with an arrow pointing straight up at you. <laughs> <laughs> and so just not intentional. I know it wasn't, but it was just funny. Like, this little arrow pointing up at you while you guys are in the air. And then just, if you look straight up, you can see the wire coming out of your mm -hmm. hand. And what a real, uh, real marvel. Great job on that photo. Thanks for looking it over in that great detail. Appreciate it. And also Larry Fast, who's not jumping in the corner, is again perfectly exposed. So kind of, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I wish I could say I planned all of that, but, but through multiple taking of it and looking at the pictures and adjust small adjustments. I finally got lucky. Okay, so this one of the San Jacinto uh, photo, what is happening here? What is, is Peter holding a flashlight or a laser or something, you know, what? Only a mirror. It's a very low tech, a very Peter moment in San Jacinto, he's always done that. That's from the 2016 tour in conjunction with Sting, that tour. and. Uh, uh, but he had done it many times in shows, a really special moment. And, and I think the audience can tell because it's just the, there's a bright light shining up at him. And he doesn't just aim it out there. He slowly moves it around. So very Peter and very uh, special the way he connects with an audience. And the transparency of what he's doing is part of its charm and the personal aspect of it. So it's a mirror and bright light shining up into it. And he... Gradually, as he sings, in conjunction with the lyrics, he, he is uh, spreading the light through the audience, you might say. And, and it's a special moment and uh, not easy to photograph. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, again, another playing one. The stick, that... Again, playing the Chapman stick, which is an instrument that can be played with one hand. So, OK, I could maybe uh, focus a little better or, or aim the camera a little better than the, just the one second of click, put it down, that I have to do on some pieces. Yeah, the lighting on that is... I mean, obviously, it's a photo of someone spreading light, but I think this is such a stunning uh, use of light. And it reminds me of your um, the photo at the Royal Albert Hall, the King Crimson one uh, mm -hmm. at the end of the show. The way, obviously, you had no control over the light, but you have control over what light you capture. And I just thought the way that you captured the audience in that um, that shot was really marvelous. It was stunning, and well, thank you. I feel like it captured Thanks, yeah. the the largeness and the importance of that venue and King Crimson playing mm. there. It was really great. Yeah, yeah, very special moment. And uh, those pictures have been used uh, in the 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 not that very picture, but one like it uh, from the same series has been used in the promotion of the 
there's a film about the, the documentary about King Crimson. Yeah, I, I'm given when on tour. You're given the lighting situation that's there, like as any live show photographer knows. You can't adjust the light because you'd like to, and you have to, you know, adjust to it. But obviously, a little easier if you're on the same stage every night with hopefully the same lighting, and you can figure it out ahead of time. Yeah, how much? Um if any processing are you doing on these especially that one with the mirror um the way you can see the highlights of peter's face and just the sort of smoky look of the spotlight <laughs> you know how much of this did you play with or is this really just all in camera uh because that was a re relatively recent one taken digitally with my digital nikon as opposed to all the other film shots in the collection which are are film Nikon. Uh, uh, I did play with it quite a bit. I wanted to enhance the smoky atmosphere and grainy. Uh, maybe I made most of that grain, but uh, uh, yeah, I wanted to enhance the grainy feel of it, the smoky feel of it. So I played with it some, not an extreme amount, but uh, I think it, it was a color image. I made it black and white for sure. There's one thing, uh, as opposed to all the other photos in the collection, which were black and white. <laughs> In the old days when you had to choose before you put the film in the camera. Oh, okay. That's right. Yeah. These were not uh, necessarily, you didn't do it after the fact. They were captured black and white. No, you could do it after the fact. Nowadays, you could right. take the color, color negative and make a black and white picture. But back then you couldn't. Well, maybe you could, but I didn't know how. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, I went back. I'm, if I'm talking about the 70s, if we're talking about the pictures I taken a Peter from the 70s and 80s and a little bit in the 90s, the pictures I was taking uh, on Tri-X film, uh, I would then develop. And so I had fun. I had a dark room in my apartment in New York and, and I had fun with that. Whereas color, I shot some color and I just shipped it out and it got done. And I I, I didn't feel that it was uh, an artistic endeavor. I, I treasure some of those pictures when I got lucky or got good pictures and I have indeed used them through the years. But the it felt different felt like making art when i would have to go into the dark room and the smell of it and the, the experience of and all the choices even just to get the picture looking decent uh, it was a really different process feeling and ironically nowadays i feel that way with with photoshop actually i spend i tinker with all of my pictures maybe more than i should but uh, in in some kind of uh, deep in my mind or in my sense it takes me back to the dark room okay it's different it doesn't have a wonderful smell uh, a distinctive smell but the uh, maybe i should just keep a, a tray of fixer next to my photoshop uh, computer and and have that smell accompany me but but i, I like it and let me ma also make a parallel between the options in photoshop or any photo editing program are remind me a lot of the sonic options of bass and guitar because compression distortion uh I'll, I'll tell you three things that, that have been there for a long time distress compression distortion and the the effect of the day the new effect that's really special but we learned i learned way back in the 70s if you use it uh, and hear the thing 10 years later it sounds like that year it sounds like oh yeah i the the mutron came out that year and i was uh, all over uh so i i I'm very leery of, of uh, effects of the day, things that look good. This happens right now with uh, AI, a lot of the things that, that enhance my photos. And, and, I, and I use them for on the web, but boy, I don't want to have it part of the uh, the basic picture, the, the negative or whatever it is I have, because I know I'll get tired of it. It'll look very dated pretty quickly with the with the digital effects. So so I, I've enjoyed uh, the parallel between the, the visual uh, experience of, of editing photos and tinkering with my bass sound and trying to get it appropriate for the piece and appropriate for what I'm doing uh, on the bass. Okay, so this next photo, I, this is my favorite one of the bunch. Uh, this is a portrait of Peter. <laughs> and yeah, man, I I've got just, it here for my. <laughs> yeah, I saw. Uh, I I just think this is such an amazing portrait. It doesn't have to be Peter Gabriel. It doesn't have to be anyone. Just as a photograph it is really beautifully executed and then because it is peter with half of a shaved head <laughs> and uh half a full head of hair i just 
it's such a cool phot photograph. I really love this. It doesn't look like, I mean, obviously you're not on stage, but it looks like you sat him down for a portrait. It would be great to hear about this. Yeah, not, nothing like that happened. Uh, we were on tour a long, long time ago, and Peter came to my room. I believe he knocked on my door, and we were, how long ago was it? We were in a motel, not a hotel. Nowadays, Peter, Peter puts us in hotels. So we're in a motel, knocks on my door. He said, I'd like to shave my hair. Now, Peter, for those who don't know the history of Genesis, Peter had famously shaved the front half of his hair and left the the back on uh, for a, an unusual look back with Janet when he was with Genesis. And at the time I'm talking about, I had been bald for a long time and shaved my hair. And, and I don't know why he keeps it. He could have done it on his own, but he, he wanted to use my razor. And, and, and I don't know. And, and so he I said, sure. And interestingly, he, he went in the bathroom without uh, uh, shaving cream. I had shaving cream stuff, but just dry. And instead of shaving the front like he had many years before, he shaved one side of it off and the, the hair was in the sink. And I'm watching this thinking, this is priceless. This is great. And I said, could you stop with half? Of, and, and, and I took the big clump of long hair out of the sink and I actually stuck it on the side of my head and it stuck because because uh, it does when you ball things stick it, it, and and i grabbed my polaroid and took a picture of that and i have a, i have that I treasure that polaroid picture of the two of us <laughs> in a very strange look uh and and he liked that and he, he kind of got into it i don't remember if he or i said well how about maybe a better picture of just him and i just brought him over by the window and so it was far from a studio or a plant thing. I brought him by the window and, and got that picture. Uh, maybe took two or three pictures. And and Peter, being a performer, got, got a very interesting look. And we finished. And he went and shaved the rest of his hair. I did not save it. eBay wasn't around, or I might have saved the hair. <laughs> I just had that thought. That would have been good. How much for Peter Gabriel's hair? Yeah, maybe uh, twenty-five um, bucks, fifty bucks. We'll see. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, so got lucky with the lighting that it looked very good. And, and this one really hung around in my photo room. Nobody else knew about it for a long time until I chose it as one of my favorite all time pictures I've taken of Peter. How did you, uh, well, there's this light that's coming from behind his hair. Did you position him in, in a place for that? Cause it's really, I feel like that's half the magic. It's almost like you got a, a backlight going on, uh, that's perfectly placed, but it's a hotel wall next to a window. Yeah. Uh, and that's, first of all, we're testing my memory here because I didn't exactly make notes of how do we do this photo. Right. It was just one photo amongst a thousand from that tour, probably 5,000 from that tour. I'm looking at the picture as we speak. Uh, I don't remember. And I got to say it was a lot, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a lighting guru when I was, places lights and knows how to do that and i admire the guys who do that and uh, try to learn from them but uh, this was just luck what a fantastic photograph and i love that it's a vertical um vertically oriented yeah. print on this uh, series. I've, re I've resolved i've resolved to go vertical more i really have been most of my since the internet came around in the 90s for me uh i've been focusing on horizontal format and and once in a while i see old portraits that are vertical and i think i gotta get back to that so in spite of the internet i'm going to do that <laughs> not the internet you know the, the apps and the way things are presented except on phones it, it works better to be horizontal yeah so i heck agree with that, i'm going vertical i felt that <laughs> same sort of resistance myself uh not yeah. that you and i are in the same class of photography i'm i'm total uh, amateur but like taking a photograph uh vertically it seems like there's only, maybe it's just the old way of thinking, but it's like there's an appropriate time and place for vertical and then everything else should be horizontal. But now with TikTok and Instagram really taking over, the vertical mm. format has become so popular that now I'm seeing, okay, well, it seems people really want to consume imagery in this way. Typical of me, I didn't even know that about, uh, about the Instagram and, and what formats work for that. I just, you know, backstage at Amsterdam before the show, they had us in a, in a, in a hallway, off a hallway that had reproductions of classic uh, 
paintings that are located in Amsterdam at the, at the museums there. And that's one of the times on this in this last few months, I would I just said to myself, I, I have to <laughs> I can't compete with the, the artisticness of those those uh, the art of those photos of those paintings. But uh, I want to go vertical some and, and I will. This one, Lay Your Hands on Me, 1983, where Peter's kind of got a lot of interesting face makeup on. Any story behind this? And he looks fairly interestingly illuminated. <laughs> I don't know if there's sort of like a spiritual pretext going on here, especially <laughs> with the face paint. You know, could you just talk about this shot and what's going on here? Sure. The, the face paint he wore on that tour, but the magic of the moment to me is that he's about to fall back into the audience in what became called crowd surfing. But back then, it was, there was no name for it. It was just something that Peter did on the song Lay Your Hands On Me. Nobody had, maybe someone had done it, but we, did, we never heard of anybody who had done that before. At great risk to himself and, and great, a great gesture of connection with the audience and literally giving himself to them as he sang Lay Your Hands On Me. Uh, so it was really special. And, and I took many, once he'd go out in the audience, we'll get to another picture of my favorite of the pictures I took of him in the audience. We were on stage vamping, lay your hands on me, singing and playing it. And it's great, but could go on a long time because the audience didn't. Well, how does the, an audience decide when to give back the performer who went out into the audience? There's no way that any road crew can go get him. It's just he, he generally, it, it varied with the place, but he would generally go out or quite a bit out and gradually he'd go around and they would bring, they would give him back always. They, they never kept him. But as he got closer to the stage, it got a little bit of a struggle because they didn't want to all give him back. And then the crew would indeed go out and, and drag what's left of him, sometimes half clothed, his clothes ripped or gone. And, uh, and he would be anyway, we had a lot of time while we vamped uh, for me to take pictures and, and uh, while singing and playing a little bit with one hand. And so I had a lot of pictures. Very few of them came out to be useful for a hundred reasons. It was just the, you know, the lighting not not designed for the artist to be in in the middle. Anyway, that's this one time or actually two times, but only two times in all that touring, he happened to look at me before he left, like, here I go. And I happened to have the camera already ready for when he, I was trying to get him falling back, something I never actually caught. But this one time, I think it's a, a precious moment. And certainly no one else would have the chance to take a picture like that of him making eye contact with me as he's about to do this. It wasn't the first time he did it, but, but pretty much a, a unique thing, a staging thing. And, and, here I go. And, and I sense that in his look that he's giving me. Was this a conversation that you had with him and other artists like, hey, I'm going to be film filming some of this uh, or photographing some of your show? You know, like, is that a conscious uh, conversation that you and Peter had? And and did he he seems kind of like a, and I mean this in the respectful way because he's one of my favorite musicians. He's a bit of a ham, <laughs> and I think he likes being on camera. So was it an enthusiastic yes, or was it like, okay, well, let's see how this plays out? You know, how did you guys get to this point where you're photographing, and it's it's not just photographing for fun. It's like these are artistic. I'm trying to capture something. That's a conversation I don't want to have with any artist. 1981, and I was in the studio, 1980, with John Lennon and Yoko Ono, and... Uh, were recording and after a few days i wandered into, wandered into the control room while they were listening to a playback with my camera of course and i said do you mind if i take a picture and john said yes i do i'd rather you please don't take a picture and so i didn't so that's the last time i had that conversation of do you mind if i take the picture i'm not a, the kind of professional photographer who's just going to take it and that's why i'm there but there's a little bit of interplay and i have a little more likelihood of getting a picture if I take it and, and let the artist, Peter included, but let the artist feel the way he feels. Of course, if they don't like it, I have lots of stories of this. If they don't like it, then they'll ask me to play or I'll sense it. Or, sorry, they'll ask me to desist. Okay, so having said that with Peter, it isn't that he loves me taking, we never had the conversation, but I know that he kind of would like it if I didn't. Let's put it this way. We have a, 
passive aggressive we're old friends we have a passive aggressive uh relationship about my taking photos so if i were to set up my camera on a tripod when the stage was in the round and i did that and he happened to be coming by on his bicycle he would happen to knock it down every night <laughs> and <laughs> and i would happen to move it out of his way before he came this is all without discussing <laughs> so so uh, he toler he all he has to do is say tony no more photos or or you know it's enough and i would stop happily uh, but he doesn't say that so does he enjoy it i think he he's I, my my guess is he smiles and thinks that's Tony being Tony, and he's always taking photos of me, and um, I'll deal with it. Plus the ham thing that you talked about, it. I'll look, I'll give give him a face or something like that once in a while. That's funny. It's like a passive aggressive sibling rivalry kind of thing. Like, yes, and and we do that on a number of things, not just photography. There's a don't want to go too off the subject, but there's there's a piece called In Your Eyes which it, near the beginning has a bass voice singing in your eyes. And for many years, many, many years, Peter comes up to me with his mic, knowing that it's not me in the house. It's the tape. He wants the sample of that. Well, I can sing it. I just, in your eyes. Uh, I can sing it, but that's not what's going on front. And he knows that I don't like to do that because it's, it's kind of pretending uh, 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 but if I kind of have to play along with it, if he's doing it, it doesn't make sense if I don't do it. So all of that is in reflected in his face. The smile he gives me when he comes over to force me to pretend to sing this thing. I do sing it and I'm hearing myself and it sounds pretty good. But uh, we, we both know out front and, and the more I passively dislike it, the more he loves doing that to me. I think in this last tour, he started with his mic doing some strange thing down miking my foot and slowly moving the mic up my body to, to the moment that, <laughs> that i didn't want, I'd want to happen it's and like the ultimate the prank <laughs> yeah yeah and I've, the beginning of the tour this tour as most tours i say what if you did that to one of the girls what, you know have them do it and then everybody will know it's a, yeah and he said mm, maybe and then he did it he, you know i was the, <laughs> so we have a number of things like that as old friends will and uh with nothing but good feelings about it. That is hysterical. <laughs> I'm turning yeah, beet red, yeah. trying not to burst out laughing. Let's get to the final photograph of this set where he is out on the audience. Yeah. And this is really a, another beautiful photograph. Um, the lighting is perfect. Every, he's illuminated. You see the excitement of the crowd. Hundreds of shots of <laughs> of the tours, couple tours where he did this, of, of my getting having not the right lens or uh, not getting the exposure wrong or lighting or w even one person in the audience being between me and him and in a way, a hand reaching over. Uh, so more than dozens, maybe maybe a hundred pictures that were wrong. So the very few that, that I chose among that had it right, uh, seem special to me and again like like uh may, most or all of these pictures i feel uh the special part of the special thing is that the vantage point i have is different than other photographers so i have had the chance to get this uh, uh lay your hands on me what it looks like from stage to see peter out there floating in the audience and uh this is an unusual situation in one way that i flipped the 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 photo horizontally uh, for artistic reasons. For some reason, the original is, is, is flipped and, and I always stick with the original, but this one I just couldn't. Having having seen it backwards, uh, it's just what I prefer. And I don't understand why that is, but that's an, an unusual feature of this to me when I see it. Although I haven't seen the original flipped, uh, unflipped version uh, in, in quite a while because I committed to this uh, many years ago. Interesting. Uh, you know, one thing that I forgot to mention on the previous Lay Your Hands on Me. Look yeah. at all those all those little eyeballs, those glasses, reflections or whatever. I just love that about yeah. this photo. These you can see just people's the lights reflecting off of their eyes. It's such a special thing about this picture. <laughs> and and all of that bless us, you know what you don't see? Cell phones held up. Oh my goodness, yeah. People are not taking pictures of things. They're just enjoying it, and it's just happening. 
we won't have that happen again, will we? <laughs> Probably. Uh, an audience, full, an audience full of pictures just with their hands up. You know, with with King Crimson, on the tour, on the last few tours, Robert Fripp uh, instituted a rule of no photos from the audience. First, it was that, and then it was no photos until Tony take, picks up his camera after the last encore, at the very end, and that's fine. I I would have liked to take pictures during the show, but I I. I it didn't seem appropriate with the audience having been asked not to, not to mention that they would see me and then, then they would all do it. Uh, so as the tours went on, I wanted to get, uh, I, I focused more on that picture. I'm, the first couple pictures I'm going to take right after it ends, uh, before they pick, because the audience would see me, especially this happened in Japan where we toured a lot and everyone has a camera or a cell phone and uh, I'd pick it up and, get a couple pictures and then the pictures would change and they would be of everybody holding their cameras up. But the applause changed drastically. So we finished the last encore. Yeah, everybody's like this. And I could wait a few seconds. And I, I just went like this with the ca with the camera in my hand and the audience and the applause would die down to maybe one or two people clapping. You know, 3,000 people, I'd go like this two people clapping or none and i would just go like this <laughs> the, wow the feeling yeah the feeling of this is the on this is the big applause was the same but the sound just went away it was just it stopped because everybody wanted a picture because they especially in japan where they're going to do what what the rules are and the rule is tony picks up his camera you could take a picture and everybody would take a picture then so that was a fascinating example of how much things have changed and how much uh the 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 reality of peaking, people taking pictures on their cell phones during the show has become part of the show. Speaking of photos on cell phones, are you using uh, your cell phone for any artistic level uh, photos? Because uh, the sensors in them now are, you can get 48 megapixel sensors in these cell phones, and I know they're very small uh, sensors and they don't capture a ton of light, but there's so much happening computationally that is not happening in a lot of our um, larger format cameras. So I'm just curious your thoughts on cell phone photo photographs for yourself. Yes, good point. And I know I did. I not only noticed that, but I am getting a new cam. I'm in the process of getting a new cell phone because of the camera. My, my current cell phone has a very good camera, but the new one, uh, as you know, the new ones have fantastic cameras and I'm going to get that specifically for a couple of shots I went from stage. On stage with Peter, uh, as I said, we did 24 shows and, and I had my Nikon. I also had a, a little 360 degree camera that I like a lot. And I also had a, a Sony point and shoot. So three cameras, uh, didn't use my cell phone on stage. And, and I'm kind of making plans for in a subtle way and hopefully in a, in a non-intrusive way, having a little bit better arsenal of uh, photography equipment on stage for the next 24 shows, the ones in the U.S. and Canada. And and it, it, it I smile because it makes me realize how much I kind of obsess about these few pictures that I that could be great that I get from stage uh, for the for the upcoming tour. And, and some, putting some thought into it won't hurt because though my Nikon's great and I have the appropriate lenses still, uh, like you said, some of the cell phones can can deal with low light better and uh, specifically get a wider angle. I want very wide angle to get the pictures of the audience. I had that with a 360, uh, very wide angle. Uh, and that was cool, but the, the quality of the 360, when you kind, kind of cut it down to 100, uh, is lacking. It's fine for web, it's fine for putting up on my web diary, but not fine for future use in a, in a book or, or a release of photos. One thing that I found fascinating about cell phone photography i have the iphone 14 pro with the you know the three lenses on the back whatever yeah and um in the low light situations a traditional camera when you keep the shutter open captures all the motion you know it's you see blurry hands and blurry faces but the cell yeah. phones they don't do that anymore it's uh they actually use it for they use light maps essentially but there's lidar there's a lidar sensor in here and it knows where you started taking the photo. So it just captures the light. So it takes incredible astral photography. If you just point it at the That's sky, 
yeah and it's it you don't see the stars move you actually it just captures more light so i'm curious to see how that would work for you on stage um and it's a different paradigm you know you'll have to <laughs> think differently if you use the low light modes but it's really really amazing what they can do uh, I'm, I'm with you and it and there's this there's the, the it's going to get great pictures but that thing I, I mentioned earlier where this the the app of the day or the sound of the day or the pedal of the day i'm going to have to be pretty discreet in how much i use the the correcting uh, features and I'll do tests of course that's easy when you're doing a show every night doing tests is, is easy uh, there's always the next show uh, but I'm going to do tests to, to be sure that uh, for the web it'll be great but to be sure that I can live with five years from now what it did to make those uh, uh, low light shots clear for sure excellent um, so the the King Crimson set that was all um, what are those things called the, the printing style, I can't think, intaglio uh, printing. Intaglio. Mm -hmm. These are digital prints. And I just want to say the, like these, for example, this one is just the closest one I had. Uh, you can see it's much more reflective. If anyone saw the video of the King Crimson prints, they were not reflective. The paper uh, is much more, I don't know, felt more handmade and artisanal, but this feels more like a photography uh, print set. So could you talk about like the decisions you and John Lybrook, the printer made, uh, for the paper and the printing of this set? Sure. John is brilliant and he's really good at all of those aspects of it. I let him make the decisions. So we have, he has sent many samples of papers to me and we've had discussions, but, but pretty much I'm guided by his, uh, decisions cause he's, it's his world. He really is expert at it. Uh, mostly it's about price point to have each pick each each uh, print handmade by him and him overseeing it and do that uh, he, he has an eye on them all but but uh, with inkjet printing it just can be a lower price point and we learned with the crimson edition that a lot of my fans are not art collectors and, and are going to be more likely to, to be interested in the photos if they're lower priced than the few hundred which they cost for the intaglio editions well, I think they actually, um, price point aside, uh, I just feel like it's a different, and I don't mean quality, like high quality, low quality. I mean, just yeah. the different quality attributes, you know, it feels like a very different product. And whereas the King Crimson one felt more like, yeah, this is, this is like an art piece. These feel more like, I don't know, museum pieces or something that I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not much of an art collector myself, um, so I don't know if you have any thoughts to share about <laughs> any of that. Well, like you, I, I don't know how to pick the words to describe the difference, but they're different and, and, and good and artistic. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't I wouldn't go through all the fuss of releasing these these five pictures uh, if, they, if I didn't feel very good about them. They're just different. And you're right, a little more photographic. Uh, prints a little more what we're a little more like what we're used to seeing photo prints uh, what, what what counts to me is that i'm i'm uh, proud to release them and, and happy to have that kind of quality image uh, available to people yeah i agree and um i like that the title of the photo is printed on the the paper as well um mm -hmm. You just know what you're looking at when you see it, and I th I appreciate that. Um, just as someone who is a fan of Peter Gabriel, you know, just looking at the photo and seeing mm -hmm. the year and the context, and I don't know, it makes it feel I feel more connected with these photos than I did with the mm -hmm. King Crimson ones. Even though mm -hmm. I'm kind of a King Crimson nerd, although I did name my first child after Peter Gabriel. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But yeah, like, I, I don't know. I, I like having the title. I love the way these turned out. I think they look really sharp and nice and they're beautiful products. So congrats nice. on the release of these. <laughs>